Hey y'all, it's your captain for all things creative coming at you with Merit at First Sight, Denver Season 17, Episode 18. If you are new to this channel, welcome. Please like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you're turning, thank you so, so much for rocking with us and know you are appreciated. So let's get into this episode. Now, to be honest, I was not interested in this week's episode, especially with Love is Blind, which I have reviews for. An avatar out on Netflix, but I tried my best, so I'll give you, you know, the greatest hits of what I could gather together. So the main scene and couple start out with is Beck and Austin. I'm go calling Michael, Brennan, and Emily, and a little bit on Cam. All right, so Becca starts this episode distraught. This woman is tired. She needs the experts to. Give her some hope, some life, some way to vent. And then um, Pastor Cal and Dr. Pepper are the experts who intervene. And I really feel for Becca because she started off the season so positive, so happy. And Austin just slowly took away her hope and her faith and her energy. And now she is just bawling and tired of his mess. She admits that communication is hard between them and she has been faking the funk she says that after they went and saw those wolves after the retreat she tried to help austin like pack some things into the car and then he mumbled under his breath at her and was noticeably upset to the point that i guess other people notice and then austin he's still trying to save his image i didn't know he was brendan's little brother number two and he's like, no, that's not how I remember it. That's not what happened. And I know Austin's good for excuse, but here he was just seemingly, you know, lying. He says, you know, I wasn't upset. I had bought gifts. I was waiting for people to pack it a certain way or something like that. I don't know. And then Becca's like, you're lying. You were visibly upset. Others noticed. And you literally said verbatim, I don't like being told what to do. And then when <laughs> Becca said that, he stopped lying, I guess, when she quoted him. So then uh, Becca said that she felt rejected lots of times, which we heard about from Emily in After Party, how he, you know, tell her, get off me, horny girl, all kind of stuff, right? And uh, she said that um, he would also do the Orion switch up, shout out to Orion, and be different to her on and off camera. So on camera, he acts like he's going to do more and be more to her. Um, the cameras aren't there. He shuts down. And I feel like we saw that at the retreat house a little bit, too, because during the day, he's kind of being nice and all that stuff. And then at night, either after drinking or just tired of faking the funk, he just got out the bed <laughs> pretending. <laughs> he, he pretended like he was going to stay in the room with her. Then he just went to somebody else's room at the end of the night. Maybe he thought cameras wouldn't see him. But um, I believe... Becca here, you know. So then um Austin's big I guess reasoning, I guess, is that the timing is just not right for them. He'd been saying he needs about like six months to warm up to people. Um, and maybe do physical things. But Dr. Pepper tells me women need to feel wanted and they're gonna, you know, get frustrated and lose hope if they don't get that out of their partner. And then Becca goes in on Austin and airs him all the way out about him constantly making excuses, which I have been saying first. It was the cats and the grandma, and then this retreat was the celebrity's bed, and then he's talking about the beer this time. And Beck was like, even like the excuse with the beer. If you knew this was a tree we were supposed to work on our intimacy and ourselves, why would you drink to get to the point where you can't, you know, do anything? And then the Dr. Pepper has kind of like, yeah, she has a point, you know. So even within his, the thinly veiled excuses, there's always a deeper thing he could have done better. And then with the sheer number of excuses, it's like she's only going to take so many excuses for so long. And her needs are going to stay unfulfilled for so long before it takes a toll on her. So how long did he think he could get away with it? <laughs> so then... Um, she also brings up how after the um, night where he left her in the room to go to the celebrity man's bedroom, 
she said that he never even apologized on his own. He said she said that um, Austin needed a producer to tell him to apologize before he did that. And then Pastor Cal asked if their relationship was worth fighting for. Becca said she had wanted the relationship badly, but after this week and the retreat, she's kind of tapped out, but she had wanted it for so long. So they're trying to spin it and be like, oh, okay, so this is, you know, the result of positive hopes and a positive desire for him being unmet. So let's stick to the positive, basically trying to push her back on a dead horse that she finally wants to get off of. Shout out to Becca for finally seeing the light. So um, Austin was, you know, saying he he wants to be where he loves her, but, and he was going to say something, and I wish they would have let him speak, but then Pastor Cal and Dr. Pepper cut him off at the butt and said, no, don't say the butt, just say you want to be with her, you know, but I was like, but he could have told whatever's been holding him back that he has been saying, what if he's about to say, I love you, I want you, but I have ED, you know, this could have been the moment where we might have got some clarity. So I was a little upset at the experts. Again, sometimes I feel like the experts do fumble the bag. So next, um, you see Austin and Becca go to a sun water spa, I guess, to get good vibes. And uh, he claims that the vibe has already improved between them since the expert came. And Becca was also kind of... Going along to get along and talking a little bit positively now that she got whatever she wanted off her biscuit. They're not fooling me. I don't think he wants her. Next, you see Chloe and Michael. Um, Chloe been putting up a wall for Michael. She's another one that got excuses. And this week, her excuse is that, you know, she got to go spend time with her pets. And she's an introvert. And I'm like, you know, you was an introvert when you got married. Like, what is this? I think... Chloe honestly wants Dr. Pepper's situation because apparently Dr. Pepper don't live with her husband. <laughs> they got their own separate houses. They see each other whenever they want to. I think Chloe probably wants something like that. She thinks she wanted to get married because maybe she felt, you know, lonely in some instances and arenas. But, like, on the day-to-day, she's a little too controlling to want a man because that's a whole person that you have to compromise for. And she don't seem willing to compromise. Everything Michael does gets on her nerves. But um, she also meets with some friend that seemed to also be like twisting her mind against Michael. And um, when she was talking with her little friend, she was saying that, you know, she did kind of miss him. But I kind of don't believe it. But when they do get back together, they plan their housewarming party because they never did that. And it's like a 90s theme. Um, after, you know, Chloe and Michael talk to all their friends, Chloe gets in her head that Michael's a people pleaser. And she also gets in her head that, like, actually the de-escalation skills that he has is bad for their marriage. And she says that in her confession. I'm like, girl, no, that's what's been saving your marriage. So she's like, Michael needs to stop, you know, trying to talk me off the ledge. And I'm just like, oh, then jump off, I guess. I don't know what to do. So then um, her desire, I guess, to um, come with her new beef with Michael about him being the problem now is in full force at the end of their scenes, you know. He's teaching her to box. Shout out to Michael, you know, for his athleticism and his arms. always showcasing that. So as much as everybody wants to talk about him wearing her pearls and wearing the skirts and stuff, he's very much a man. Comfortable with his masculinity. He always, you know, shows Chloe that. Then, um, you know, when Chloe doesn't have, you know, the pearls and skirts, whatever, to complain about, as he's teaching her to box and being overtly masculine again, she you know, talks to him about being a people pleaser and asks him, you know, what he needs from her since he has been the rock in the relationship in the past, but he has to stop trying to be so perfect and blah, blah, blah. So now she's going to try to, again, I think, shift a little blame onto him, but I don't think Chloe wants Michael, so we'll see how this goes. Next couple, Brennan and Emily. And again, this is just, I say, like, daddy daycare, you know, Brendan 
is just happy to not have any pressure to, you know, love on Emily in like the romantic sense. He's like a, a, a daycare dad or like play nurse to her. You see him get her hamburgers and she looking like a kid being happy. Like, oh, he got me burgers when I said I was hungry. And then um, he goes with her to get her stitches taken out. Apparently she had 35 total stitches, which is a lot. And uh, they they had said, well, I guess last week or when it happened, that she would need plastic surgery. Because, yeah, them scars still don't look that great. And I, I don't know what techniques, you know, can be used um, for, like, head injuries in particular. But, oof, those, she looks like she got the old school Frankenstein stitches for real. So then um, Brennan and Emily um, end the episode, I guess, talking to the experts about their trauma. Because, obviously, Emily has direct trauma from the accident. But um, Brennan has his own, you know situation of dealing with her and then now being a caretaker to her so you know they're kind of applauding him for you know being there for her and they're all being positive about it but again I think that um this is perfect timing for Brandon because <laughs> now he can you know be a nice guy be the good guy on camera that he always wanted to be and it's no pressure because Emily literally has to heal so last but not least the main I guess big thing that happened with sort of couple ish that um, I'll end with is Claire and Cameron. Claire's talking about Cameron, not to Cameron because Cameron is still <laughs> avoiding her. And Cameron is talking, you know, back from the dead. And we find out that he has an atrial flutter. And um, he also says that Claire has been talking about their relationship to everyone and um her perspectives and feelings are changing and deepening but his really aren't because he can't talk for long periods of time and um he thinks that when it comes to claire she's going to be emotional about um you know decision day and i was like wait didn't y'all have y'all decision day already down to the couple dinner where you asked her you want to be together on the three one two three hut you know but i guess he's thinking there's going to be another decision day and um claire though when she's talking she's saying that she she thinks such a beautiful relationship again she really likes that she just doesn't think husband and wife is the correct name for it and then um when cameron is asked if you think they're going to rekindle he starts struggling to breathe and again puts the feelings onto Claire, but I think he's still a little disappointed. And ultimately he says he would stay with Claire if she wanted them to stay together on decision day. Cause he don't want to leave her hanging out to dry. And I'm just confused by the both of them. So I just hope that Claire stops confusing people by trying to force her way back into Cameron's life. I think Cameron was at one point trying to get distance and closure, but now even he is, I guess, thinking that they're going to have another chance to <laughs> come back together. And if she wants it, he says, all right, I'm in if she's in. So we'll see what happens with them too. Say what you think in the comments. Should they get back together? Is this all a bad dream? <laughs> We're about to wake up to maybe a better future. I don't know, but regardless, you're the master of your fate. And the captain of your soul. And we'll talk more later.